From the studios of the Defense Media Activity, this is the Chief of Naval Personnel All Hands Call with Vice Admiral Bill Moran and Fleet Master Chief April Beldo. And now, your moderator, Petty Officer Brandy Wills. Good afternoon and welcome to the CNP's Live All Hands Call. I'm Petty Officer Brandy Wills and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're going to be taking questions all around the world via satellite, social media, and telephone calls, giving sailors the chance to ask their questions regarding personnel issues in the Navy. With us, we have uh, Chief of Naval Personnel, Vice Admiral Bill Moran, and Fleet Master Chief April Beldo to answer questions. Uh, Admiral, the floor is yours. Well, I think uh, Fleet and I are anxious to hear from sailors, so without a long speech, I'd uh, rather just get to your questions, the questions from the fleet, so uh, we're ready to go. Okay, and with that, our first question is coming in from Norfolk via satellite. So, Norfolk, whenever you are ready, please go ahead with your question. Good afternoon, sir. This is I-22 Pagan from the USS Theodore Roosevelt. My question is, what's the Navy's next area of focus for personnel budget cuts, and how soon could we see those be implemented? Uh, we, we don't have any plans to cut uh, personnel at all. CNO was... Uh, in uh, Navy Times this week. It came out uh, earlier in the week and he had a long extended interview about where he, see, he sees things going. And frankly, I think uh, the stability of the force that we see in the future across the next five years uh, indicates to all of us that we're pretty stable in where we are with personnel. Uh, so I'm not anticipating having to uh, cut people at all. In fact, uh, we're just finishing the tail end of a growth period in the Navy uh, and uh, I, I think the, the, the future is really bright for folks that want to continue to serve. And uh, so as far as I'm concerned, this is uh, looking pretty good for, for the Navy in terms of personnel and uh, not seeing any cuts in the future. Okay, fantastic news for us. Thank you, uh, sir. Our next question is coming to you from San Diego. So San Diego, when you are ready, go ahead. Hello, sir. I'm a MCS in Farrington, stationed at Inpace West in San Diego. Uh, I read recently that sea pay is uh, going up. I was wondering uh, how much more money sailors can expect and when will the, t the changes take place? Question. It's uh, the Secretary of the Navy signed the career sea pay package yesterday, and it was announced uh, publicly. Uh, we put out a media spread on it yesterday. Uh, so as soon as we can get DFAS to, uh, to update all the pay tables, which is a process and process takes a little bit of time, we think within the next 60 days we're going to start uh, be, to be able to start improving the pay of anybody that's on career city pay today. So that's a across the board 25% increase in all career city pay tables and a doubling of career city pay premium, which uh, affects sailors that have been on continuous sea duty for more than 36 months. So a very good news story for the folks out in San Diego and Norfolk and elsewhere that are uh, on career sea pay today. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, Admiral, we're going to uh, go back to Norfolk now and take another question. So when you guys are ready, please ask away. I don't think they're ready. All right. Whenever you're ready. There we go. Good afternoon, sir. QMS. Good afternoon, sir. QMS and Gleason from USS Theodore Roosevelt. Sir, my question for you is, when will the new fire retardant coveralls be available for the fleet? Well, I, I think you are aware that Admiral Gortney has been spearheading this down at Fleet Forces, and uh, as I understand it, uh, right now those those fire retardant coveralls are being issued to the 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 deployers who are in the very near term. But by the end of this fiscal year, so by the end of the summer, all, all ships uh, and uh, deployable units in the fleet will have uh, these fire retardant coveralls issued to them. Uh, every sailor that deploys or is going to be part of ship's company will have that available to them. All right. We are going to go to our first question via telephone. It's from USS Harper's Ferry, which is currently deployed to the 5th Fleet AOR. Harpers Ferry, are you there? Yes. Okay, I, go, we ahead. Are here. go ahead with your question then. Yes, sir. My name is E.C. Downs, and uh, good afternoon. My question concerns, uh, does the Navy have any intentions to turn the Career Intermission Program 
from a pilot to a regular annual program? Another great question. I love these questions. Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, so we, we think that uh, the take rate on career intermission program has been lower than expected. And we think the reason for that is because it is called a pilot. And a lot of sailors and officers uh, don't want to roll the dice or, or risk their career on a pilot program. Uh, even though the results that we've had from folks that have gone out and done this program have been very positive. People have been able to go out on a career in a mission, uh, get their college degree if that's what they choose to do, start a family if that's what they choose to do, uh, start another job, see if uh, the grass is greener on the other side, and have come back into the Navy and picked right up where they left off. Uh, so we think there's a, a lot of good reason to want to take this program and make it uh, permanent and not a pilot program. So we're seeking some uh, relief from Congress over the next year uh, to remove the pilot moniker from it and institutionalize it across the Navy and open it up to more, more sailors. And I think the take rates will go up and we'll see better participation rates. So great question. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Harper's Ferry. We're going to go back to San Diego now, sir. So San Diego, go ahead. Yes, sir, this is one with Scott from San Diego. Uh, I read that uh, good conduct awards will no longer be accepted on investment exams in the future. Is this true? I'm not, Pastor Scott, I'm going to turn that over to Fleet uh, Beldo. I think she's been working on this uh, with Leadership Mess and Mick Pond, so I'm going to let her answer that question. Thank you. Good afternoon, Pastor Scott, and thank you for that question. And I just want to make sure I understood it with regards to good conduct medal points are no longer going to be um, given um, consideration on the advancement exam. Yes, yes. Um, we have been working hard on figuring out if we have the way that we score our advancement exams correctly. It's been a um, project that's um, been um, worked on for about the last 18 months. And one of the things that we are um, focusing on is evaluations, performance, and your advancement um, score. But right now, we're not going to um, um, change the um, points that you're given for awards. That was something that we were considering, but after um, further, further looking down um, at what needed to be considered and what didn't, we're going to keep it, um, good conduct points on the exam. Hope that answers your question. Hey, Scott, let, me, let me add in here, uh, because there's a lot being talked about and discussed about advancement exams, and I think it's important for sailors to know that while we're talking about it, nothing's being implemented in the March exam cycle. We may implement in September if we can get all of the mills per manual changes out there and everybody notified so they know what to expect. But I'd say it's more likely a year from now is when you'll see these changes take place. And we will communicate that to all of you, what those changes are. But to Fleet Beldo's point, and Mick Pond is very strong on this, is we're trying, we are trying to recognize performance over everything else. Uh, testing is important at the lower ranks. At the higher you go, we think leadership and performance is more important. And so you'll see the weighting in the final multiple score change to recognize that. And we're also probably going to look at, you know, just because you've taken the test eight times uh, doesn't mean you should jump above people who are scoring very high on their first time. We want to reward performance uh, across the board, and that's what you're going to see in the future. Okay? Thank excellent, you. excellent guidance to put out right now, especially because advancement exams start tomorrow. Yes, so <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, next, we have a recorded video question from USS Bataan, which is currently deployed. Hello, sir. LS2, Charles McNeely from Port Huron, Michigan, stationed on board the USS Bataan. So I was wondering if you could speak on the proposed CPA incentives and when they might hit the fleet. Additionally, I was wondering if you could speak on the proposed long deployment pay incentive. Okay, great question. And the reason I'm getting that question from Bataan is because uh, we visited them right before they went on deployment about a week. So I hope deployment's going well for you out there. Uh, I answered the question earlier on career CPA. So the package uh, as we discussed back in January, has been signed by the Secretary this week. Uh, so you will start seeing that, uh, that CPA increase in your LES uh, while you're on deployment, I'd say within about two months. It's going to take us that long to get the CPA tables updated in the DFAS system. 
The, the long deployment allowance that I also discussed back then is something that we are going forward, that, that being the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations are going forward to SECDEF uh, here in the next couple weeks uh, and talk about, you know, if, as, as the war comes down in Afghanistan and we start pulling back, the Navy is going to be asked to do more forward. Uh, we're going to be out there and we're going to be out there on potentially longer deployments. Uh, many, many uh, carrier uh, sailors and CSG sailors on small boys are already doing that. And we think we need to compensate sailors on long, arduous deployments. That is, deployments that exceed 190 days consecutive. And so that, there, is a, there is a law in place that allows us to pay sailors an extra stipend if they're at sea for greater than 190 days or deployed for greater than 190 days consecutive. That law was suspended right after 9-11, because you could imagine we're going to war, we're sending lots of people forward, and we weren't sure how long they were going to be forward, but uh, it, it, was, it was just too difficult to project how much it was going to cost us while we're trying to fight a war. So we think that, that, that we would like to see that loss, uh, that suspension lifted, so when we start deploying longer or we have sailors on longer deployments, like potentially Bataan, uh, we can compensate sailors for those those longer deployments. And it works out to if you go greater than 190 days for every month beyond that, you get an extra stipend. And that, that the range of that pay is up to the Secretary of the Navy and he's considering what that ought to be right now. So thanks for the great question and, and good luck on deployment. Okay. Now, before we started, I live tweeted a photo out of our studio audience because that's the day and age that we live in now. We tweet and we use Facebook and we use Tumblr and all those things to get our message out. So we actually have a question that came in via Twitter and it is from AC3 William Respondek from the CAT-C73 team in Yokosuka, Japan. And he asks, I had recently read in the Military Times that our advancements were going to be more influenced in the near future by our evals instead of solely our test scores to help those with strong leadership skills and weaker academic skills advance. So the sailors who just get pushed through on PNA points, they aren't gonna make the cut, which you touched on this earlier, sir, but he wants to know, any word on how this will take effect or when? Which you also kind of touched on. Yeah, go ahead, Fleet. Well, as we talked about right now, March exam that starts tomorrow cycle and probably September, it won't go into effect because we still want to make sure we get it right. We want to make sure all the instructions are correct and everybody has an understanding of how the change is going to affect them. So we probably won't see this change until the March 15 exam. And then what else was as far as the weight of, um, he was asking how you saw it okay. taking effect, right. so how it will be implemented. Well, I will share with AC. Yes, AC3. AC3. We will share with AC3. Right now, that's what we're working on, too, is what areas deserve more weight than the other ones. And again, that's something we want to get right. We just don't want to do it the first time and then have to go back and change it. So we're taking our time on this because we want to do it right the first time. So we're not jerking our sailors around. That's real important to all right, we're going to go back to San Diego now. San Diego, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. I am uh, Petty Officer Derek Stroop from San Diego, California. And I was just wondering with the uh, wars winding down in uh, the Middle East, if uh, we naval personnel are gonna see any cuts, personnel cuts. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, it was one of the earlier questions that when we started this session, a similar a uh, concern that you know, I'm sure you're reading about cuts in the Army, cuts in the Air Force, cuts in the Marine Corps, uh, but when you look at our budget that was just released and announced uh, earlier this week, uh, we're staying relatively stable across the next five years. So today the Navy is about 324,000 sailors. Um, in fiscal year 19, four or five years from now, it's 324,000 sailors. So we look pretty stable, and that's because we man equipment, we man ships. Uh, we don't equip people. It's, a, it's the other way around. So if we have a force structure that's got so many ships and squadrons and, and units, then we need pe that number of people to man it. And, uh, and the forecast as far out as we can see in the current approved budget, it is in, uh, it, we're very stable at about 324,000 folks. So I, I don't see any changes, like I said earlier. No, no cuts are on the table today in, in my world. So I think we're, 
we've got a pretty good bright future for the Navy. All right, thank you, San Diego. Our next question is another phone question from USS Harper's Ferry. Are you there, Harper's Ferry? Uh, yes, we are. Okay, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is IT1 Gaskill from USS Harper's Ferry. And my question is, with the new uniforms that are coming in, has there been any consideration to giving service members a uniform, a uniform allowance raise or doing a one-for-one -one trade with uniforms? IT1, thanks for the question. Uh, there is, we are not considering an increase to the uniform allowance at, at the moment. Uh, I think if there's an adjustment we can make uh, over time is when we, get, when we get enough stock of the fire-resistant coveralls that we make it part of the sea bag issue right out of boot camp so sailors aren't having to wait when they get to Pierside or get to the fleet to get those. Uh, of course, it, today it's organizational level clothing, so sailors aren't paying for those coveralls and nor do we intend to have them pay in the future. So that'll be part of the sea bag. Uh, there are very few uniform changes coming uh, for most sailors in the Navy. The, the ones we're talking about that you've heard me talk about are a year, two, in some cases, three years or further out. And we'll continue to look at the, uh, the, the uniform allowance as those, thing, as those uniforms come out. But what we're trying to do in this in the, our strategy for uniforms, whether you're talking male uniforms or female uniforms, is to drive down our, the, our cost to, uh, to, uh, to put uniforms out there so everyone uh, has, has got a, kind of an equal cost in, in what they have to spend on uniforms. And it also drives down our cost. The more uniform we can make the Navy, uh, the less variety that we have to support and the least cost across the Navy. So that, that's our strategy. Uh, but there's no adjustment to the uniform allowance to, to get right to your question. Fleet? And what I would add, sir, too, is what we also um, in, um, historically have done is we phase in uniforms for our sailors. So you'll get your clothing allowance like you always do now. And we won't all, we will never say, as of right now, you have to change uniforms, go out and buy all new uniforms. We always phase it in, keeping in mind that you get a uniform allowance and allowing you the time to get that money before we have a mandatory time that you have yeah. to change into the new uniform. Great point. Speaking on uniforms, is there any word on the, the new blues for the women, the women going to the Dixie Cub, that, that uniform initiative? Yeah, we're, we're right now in the early uh, stages of getting women uh, measured and some um, participants in a uniform wear uh, period. So we're going to test these uniforms uh, so that we get it right instead of, you know, the usual, uh, here's a uniform, it, it, go wear it, and, uh, and oh, by the way, you got to pay to get it fitted. Uh, we're going to try to do this right this time. Uh, so that, that is going to take several months, and then after that period of time, we'll collect the data, we'll get the feedback, we'll make adjustments, and then we'll go for a longer period of time to bring in more participants into that. So we'll grow from a small cadre to a much larger cohort group that can look at it. And then we'll make those adjustments, get them to the manufacturers, compete them, and then we'll start rolling it out. But we're going to keep uh, hitting this drumbeat on the uniforms month after month after month so people aren't surprised when it comes out. Uh, but, but make no mistake, we are moving towards uniformity in the service dress blue, much like we have in the service dress whites today. And by the way, we know there are issues with the whites, we know there are issues with khakis, uh, on, especially on the women's side, and we are addressing those as we do all of this. It's not gonna be just give you another uniform and go make it, go make it fit. We're gonna try to do it together. That's extremely appreciated. Yeah, I bet Thank it is. You. <laughs> so you have to be patient with us because all that work that Admiral Moran was talking about does take time, but we do wanna get it right. Absolutely. We're gonna go back over to Norfolk now for another question. So Norfolk, when you're ready. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Kilma Torres from USS Theodore Roosevelt. In regards to the green DG camouflage uniforms that are being utilized on short commands, are we going to be implementing on board naval, ves naval vessels the green DG camouflage, sir? Yeah. QM1, I think that what you're referring to is a Type 3 NW uniform, and uh, the answer is no. 
what you're wearing is what is uh, authorized for shipboard uh, use and shipboard wear. And of course, when you're at sea, the fire resistant coveralls is going to be the standard uniform for sailors at sea. Uh, so we have, no, we have no intention of opening up NWU type threes um, to shipboard use. Thanks for the question. Let's uh, get a question from our studio audience now. Uh, All right. Two shootsmen from uh, Nyack, Maryland. This question is for Fleet Master Chief. Uh, with everything going on globally, is there are there plans to um, implement some sort of training to help educate uh, sailors on geographic and political issues? Thank you for the question. <laughs> oh yeah, and your rate was CT CTN two. Um, I, I think. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Admiral Brand to help me with this, but I believe as an um, organization, we are continu continually educating our sailors with regards to what's going on globally and how we need to be aware of, um, of um, any type of um, concerns or attacks or anything like that. I think we need to be, that's a 365-day-a-year um, attitude that we need to take, especially when we do forward deploy. But I, I want to almost, you know, brag on our, our, our 10th fleet and our, our, our CTs out there communicating, getting us information so we will know where we stand um, with regards to global terrorism. Is that what you're sort of talking about? Yes, ma'am. All right. So um, did those did those chiefs back there set you up? Uh, are, 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 yeah, they're going to no, get no, it no, when they, we're they done. I, me. No, I'm just they joking. Me. I'm just joking. <laughs> they, no, that was a good question. Um, Ryan, you have anything yeah, else? I would say, there? you know, we've got a long way to go to really take the Navy to the next level in terms of training. Uh, we've, we've got the right mechanisms in place. When you look at Navy Knowledge Online, it's, it's uh, kind of a, at its infancy stage in growing and maturing. But we've got to take that to the next level and really get some interactive training that's a, a little bit more sophisticated than what we have today uh, to get at your point. So it, we can turn on it quickly. We can get fresh data, fresh information for any sailors deploying around the world. Uh, to, to be able to get political insights as well as the counterterrorism insights that are required in the training today. So your point is well taken, and I think we do have to continue to work this uh, through better training methods. And the technology's got to, we got to move technology, we've got to move along with technology, which is a little slow on that sometimes. So uh, we're, we're working on that, but it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, we have a pre-recorded question coming in this time. It's from Diego Garcia. This is MC3 Alex Medigard, stationed aboard Diego Garcia. My question is for the Chief of Naval Personnel. Sir, regarding the sequestration, what is the Navy's biggest challenge for the current fiscal year? Yeah, it's really good to see you in Diego Garcia. I've uh, got a little time on that, that tiny slit of island out there. and. Uh, uh, it's a lot warmer out there than it is right here at the moment. Um, so um, uh, I, your question is a great question. Uh, th these are things that we, we try to balance uh, when we build a budget in the Navy uh, every year. And sequestration has made it very difficult because the cuts are significant. And they're what we call arbitrary. We don't get to choose necessarily where those cuts come from. So when we're making those trades, we've got to understand the law, and then we've got to understand where our limits are. So I think uh, what the CNO has discussed uh, about his priorities, about making sure the fleet is modern in the future and is also ready is, uh, is what's most important. And that's probably the area that we focus on the most uh, from the personnel side of the house is how do we make sailors the most ready they can be? How good can the training be? Is it timely? Is it effective uh, for the billet you're going to so that when you arrive in the fleet at your unit, you're ready to operate uh, forward, as, as we like to say. So that, those cha the, the readiness piece is a big challenge, uh, and our challenge to keep the quality of service at a level where we keep quality sailors in the Navy is probably our biggest challenge under sequestration. In fact, in any environment, uh, trying to make sure that we we keep really good folks in the Navy so that we are ready when the time comes. Thank you for that question. Okay, I think we have another sailor from our audience who wants to ask a question, sir. So, why don't you come on up? We're getting coached by the chiefs <laughs> back there. You can see Those that. chiefs are sneaky. <laughs> good afternoon, sir. CTI three Richardson from Nyack, Maryland. Uh, I would like you to comment, sir, if you could on sailors receiving their orders in a more timely manner. Uh, the concern has come up about 
sailors having to wait a long time to get last minute orders. More specifically, sailors being skipped over. Um, those sailors who try to follow the seashore rotation, uh, that is um, the guidance, um, but getting skipped over in CMS ID as they try to follow that rotation. Yeah, uh, so last year under, under the continuing resolution and the government shutdown, we, we had to slow down uh, our ability to write orders far in advance because we were living month to month, quarter to quarter in the budget world. Uh, and so we were only being doled out money to get us to the end of the quarter. So we couldn't commit to things that were beyond the end of a quarter, if you, if you follow me. So yeah, we were notifying sailors and families much too late. And, uh, w but we couldn't do anything about that, to be perfectly frank. Now that we have a budget, you shouldn't be seeing that. We should be back on a normal path to giving six months notice, getting orders in hand, uh, being able to work through CMS ID, uh, working with your career counselors, working with the Bureau to make sure we give you plenty of notice and, and see opportunity out there for where you want to go and what job. Uh, so I think we're back off of that awful place we were last fall and it was not pretty and, and we did not do a great job of taking care of sailors by no, giving them plenty of notification. The budget constraints were what they were, uh, but we're off that now and we're back on, on the normal cycle. Thank you. Sir, we're going to take a question from Misawa, Japan now. It was pre-recorded, so. My question is, with future budget cuts on the way, where do you see the Navy in terms of family readiness with budget cuts coming uh, to BAH, BAS, uh, and reduction in commissaries? Okay, you know, you, you probably, maybe you haven't read my, my little Mythbuster uh, blog that I come out with every now and then, but I spend a lot of time on the road breaking some of these myths, and, 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 you, and you just brought three of them up. Uh, if you look at the budget in 15, um, BAH is going up, BAS is going up, and we're getting a whopping 1% pay raise. Now, now, that's not a lot. You know, we've been used to bigger pay raises and bigger increases in those programs in the past, uh, but in, in these budget, in this fiscally pressurized environment, We've had to make some tough choices about where we can take risk. And what we've decided to do is to slow the rate of growth in all those programs. So while there are increases, they're smaller than what you normally get, but they are certainly not cuts to those programs. And that's the myth that's out there, that we're cutting BAH, we're cutting BAS, we're cutting your pay. We are not doing those things, but we are slowing the rate of growth. Uh, on commissaries, uh, a lot of discussion about commissaries uh, but all that's going on with the commissaries right now is we're, we are going to reduce the subsidy that commissaries get today. We're not closing commissaries, but we're going to reduce the subsidy, which may, and I say may, depending on what area you're in, it may cause an increase in some of the pricing that goes on in your local commissaries. So that might be an added expense that you weren't expecting. But we're not closing commissaries, we're not cutting them. So again, myth busting. Um, a lot of those things are out there. It's easy to say we're cutting, 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 when in fact what we're really trying to do is just slow the rate of growth so that we can continue to modernize and we can keep the force structure that we need to operate the Navy. And if in fact you haven't seen the Admiral's blog, you can catch it on Navy.mil or on the Navy Live blog. So go ahead, log on to Navy.mil, you can <laughs> find that link. So our next question, we're going to go back over to Norfolk, sir. Good afternoon, sir. This is IS3 German from the USS Theodore Roosevelt. You already mentioned the 1% pay raises. My question is, will any other programs be cut, and how will that affect Navy families? The, uh, there are no plans to cut any of our pays and allowances, the only thing that has been cut technically is uh, imminent danger pay in certain regions of the world. So if you're deployed, uh, Donald Cook's out there on deployment now in Fifth Fleet, uh, in June that imminent danger pay region will no longer be in effect. And I think it's important for us to understand why. I mean, we're coming off war in, in the Fifth Fleet AOR, we're in the CENTCOM AOR, and when the combatant commander uh, decided over a year ago that it was time to start reducing the cost of that by reducing imminent danger pay in some of the regions around his AOR. 
um, we started moving in that direction and that announcement was made right before the holidays. So it came out and in June, in the, in, uh, imminent danger pay is being cut in certain regions. But what's not being cut, which is also a myth buster, is that com uh, combat tax exclusion zones are also going away with imminent danger pay. Not true. We have not touched any of the combat tax exclusion zones. And in some areas, we've actually added pays to uh, places like Bahrain, uh, where, where there are some challenges with no commissaries and some expenses out there that we've added some money for sailors that are deployed there. But the imminent danger pay for Bahrain, for example, is going to go away starting in June. So it's a little bit of, uh, uh, there are some cuts to things that are DOD wide, but Navy specific, uh, I don't have any more than that to offer to you, and I'm, I'm sure you're happy about that. Thanks for the question. Okay, we have a question that came in uh, via our social media right now. It's from David Callis, and he asked, uh, are there any planned changes to the higher tenure policy? Uh, great question. I, I have no plans to change the higher tenure policy. Um, I hate to give you a short answer, but you probably appreciate that. Uh, no plans to change higher tenure. Uh, we, we often look at how we're going to shape the force of the future, whether we need to do that through incentives to ask people to leave when we need to. But we're not in a position in the Navy right now where we need people to leave. I want people to stay. I want good people to stay. So our incentives are about keeping good quality people to stay, not asking people to leave. Sounds good, sir. We have a phone call coming in right now. It is from USS Lake Champlain. Lake Champlain, go ahead with your question when you're ready. Good afternoon, I'm Admiral I2 on Walt Lake Champlain. Uh, my question for you, sir, although the Secretary of Defense proposed reducing the size of the Army, would that potentially affect the Navy as well? And if so, is the Navy facing a period of mental manning like to reduce optimal manning we're currently seeing. I could barely hear you, but I think uh, the question is, is the, is the expected drawdown in the size of the Army going to affect the Navy? And the answer is, I don't think so. I think um, you, you're going to see some things that the Army has to do to reduce its, its size if that's the way they choose to go. Uh, and that will affect only one thing, and that is that sailors start to believe that what the Army is doing is what we're going to do. And, and we're not, okay? I, I spoke earlier about the st stability in our force structure, uh, the relative uh, same size of the manning profile throughout the next five years. Uh, so I don't see the, the effects of what the Army ha may have to do uh, having a, an impact on us. Um, I, I couldn't hear part two of your question. Could you repeat that? Yes, sir. Uh, if so, is the Navy facing a period of minimal manning vice to reduce the optimal manning for servicing? No, I'm glad you asked the question. So we are not doing any, anything remotely close to optimal manning or minimal manning in the fleet. My targets right now are to raise manning in the fleet across the board to get uh, ships, units, squadrons up to 90% fit, which means the right sailor with the right training NEC uh, in the right job, and 95% fill. So 95% of all the billets on, on any of those units will be filled by a sailor, with 90% of them being by the right sailor. And you can imagine we need a buffer there because it's not, it's not a perfect solution. People come and go for a variety of reasons. Uh, but we are today the fleet in, in the aggregate. We are at 90-95 today. And I'm sure there are sailors that are listening to me right now on units and ships around the fleet that are going, what are you talking about, CMP? My ship's nowhere near there. And I understand that. I'm talking about in the aggregate. So deployed units are pretty close to 100%, even greater than 100% in some cases. And then there are other units that are in the very early basic stages of an FRP that are nowhere near 90, 95. But what we're working towards is getting everybody to that level over the next year, and I think you'll see positive change, especially this summer when a lot more sailors come out of, come out of the training pipeline that we, we put into the training pipe last year. We, we, we assessed 40,000 sailors last year, where a normal year for us is 33 to 35,000. So we assessed a bunch more. 
so that we could start filling in uh, some of those apprentice jobs that were vacant in the fleet. So uh, we're not looking at any schemes to go to optimal manning or minimal manning. We're, do we're actually taking the opposite tack, which is to fill up the manning levels in these units so that we are ready to do what we have to do. Thanks for the question. Getting sailors at sea, where we belong. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. All right. <laughs> We're going to go back over to San Diego now. So, San Diego, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Maybe F1 Cooper from the PCD America. As far as the ships deploying, is the 10 month deployment the new norm for our Navy at the moment? Uh, shipmate, I'll tell you, I know there's, there's enough units out there that have done that kind of deployment. It is not the norm. The norm is probably closer to six and a half to seven months. Uh, but I know, for example, uh, uh, more than a couple carriers in the last two years have not only done nine month deployments, but have done back to back nine month deployments. Uh, and that's primarily been driven uh, by several factors. But the big one is, is just kind of things like Syria. Things like, um, you know, the Crimea situation, which could drive naval forces from one region to another and have to extend longer. Um, you, you know how volatile the Persian Gulf has been and, and, and behavior of, uh, of countries like Iran and what that does to our posture. So uh, it, it's difficult to tell how long deployments will be. But until we can stabilize our FRP, uh, and Admiral Gortney talks a lot about this uh, optimized FRP, that he's, that he's bringing forward, and we're going to start here after Truman gets home from its deployment today. Uh, we're going to try to go to a more uh, predictable and stable deployment cycle inside of a, a normal FRP. We haven't done that in years. It's been very challenging for the Navy for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I think the, the norm is much closer to six and a half to seven months. The, and it's unusual to see us out at 10 months, but it is happening. BMD ships are doing long deployments. Uh, as an example. So that's why we are, when I talked earlier, I don't know if you caught it, but when we were talking about this high deployment allowance that is currently uh, suspended, we can't, we can't pay sailors that, that go on those longer deployments. We, we, including the CNO and the Secretary of the Navy, want to change that and uh, allow us to start paying for deployments that last uh, seven, eight, nine, ten months. So you get, you get compensated for that extra time at sea. Speaking of those who are at sea, we have another phone call from Lake Champlain. Okay. So Lake Champlain, when you're ready, go ahead. Good afternoon, Admiral. Abby Q. Thorpe, Lake Champlain Weapons Department. My question is, due to budget cuts and personnel cutbacks, is there any change in place to make the recruiting and recruit training process a more selective one to ensure more quality sailors are meeting the fleet? Uh, first of all, we're not cutting people. I, I know that's hard to believe in this, in this environment, but we are not cutting people. Uh, second of all, I think the question was, uh, what are we doing in recruiting to, uh, to raise the standard of recruits? Is that, was that basic premise of your question? Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. Uh, you know, the data that I see that comes in from recruiting command month after month, and I see it every month, is that the quality of recruits based on uh, test scores that you're all familiar with and high school graduates, uh, we, are at a high, we are at a high point in the Navy in terms of re recruiting uh, and accessions of sailors. So when you look at those two metrics, we're doing pretty darn good. Um, but I, I, I take from your question that you're not entirely happy with everyone that you're getting out there. So. Um, I, would, I would ask you to give me some examples of the things that uh, are frustrating you by the quality of sail that's coming out of Great Lakes or A schools and C schools. Oh, well, Admiral, some of the things that I'm seeing is um, we have families that come here that really want to collect their paycheck and they don't want to do their job to earn it. And that's something that a test score is unable to test for. Okay. So is there anything in the, that recruiters can do to uh, screen somebody 
that maybe their uh, personnel qualities aren't as high as as others. Something that uh, something that a test can't try to train for. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll take that one offline and maybe uh, write about it based on my recent, our recent trip to Great Lakes where we sat down with the recruiters and, and the uh, RDCs at Great Lakes uh, and give you some feedback about what we learned from that trip. And there are some concerns, and you've got some valid ones. And I'll try to, I'll try to write about that and inform you that way because I could spend the better part of the remaining hour here talking about it because it's really important. Great question, and uh, and I'll take that for action, okay? Thank you very much, Lake Champlain. Hi, We're going to go to our studio audience now, so go okay. ahead. Okay. Good morning, sir. My name is Petty Officer Zeman. My question is with regards to the Cyber Warfare Engineer Program available to officers. Are there any plans in the future to have a similar program available to the enlisted personnel or with a growing need of cyber camp, uh, capabilities? a more of an emphasis on tra uh, training for computer programming for enlisted? Well, boy, uh, all I know right now and talking to Admiral Branch and Admiral Rogers and Admiral Ty and others in, that are working this really hard is that it, this whole information dominance era is exploding around us. And so we're trying to get our arms around making sure we, we are targeting the right areas to, to develop expertise, both in the officer and in the enlisted program. So uh, I don't have a specific answer. I don't know, if Fleet, if you've got one on that particular one. No, sir, um, I don't. But, I, I think, as you shared with yeah. you, we're continuing to look at ways that we can be more, like Admiral talked about, up with the technology that we have today and getting there faster. Yeah. Uh, on, the, on the computer programming piece, I'll take that back um, and talk to Admiral Branch about it and see if he's uh, got some ideas uh, and maybe we can write about that together and, and inform, you, uh, inform you that way, if that's okay. Yes, sir. Thank okay. you very much, Thanks sir. for the question. Thank you, Master Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to where it's warm. Let's go to San Diego, so go ahead when you're ready. Yes, sir. CSSN Rising with the USS Peleliu. My question is, um, if our deployment or if our war is drawing down, why are our deployments getting longer? Well, uh, it, that's a great question. It, it would be uh, more along the lines of the nation has seen our land forces at war for 12 years and beyond. And, and as those folks pull back, you got to have a defensive back out there somewhere to make sure that no one uh, gets into any kind of mischief that we wouldn't want them in. So it, the place you want to be is at sea where you've got kind of sovereignty and freedom of, of maneuver to respond and to provide a deterrent force as we're withdrawn. And then once, once we're out of their region on land, uh, it's always good to be sending signals to your allies as well as your potential enemies, adversaries, um, that we're still, the United States is still out there. That's what the Navy's done throughout its history and we're going to continue to do it. So the reason why they may get a little longer is because we're trying to get ships back and get them into maintenance. And to do that, we may have to extend others to give those ships that have missed their maintenance availabilities and modernization availabilities and get, a, get an opportunity to get that done. And so we're just going to kind of ebb and flow over the next couple of years as we do that, get the maintenance levels and the modernization levels back up. And then we can re, uh, re set, if you will, the uh, deployment cycles to align with what Admiral Gortney's trying to do with the uh, OFRP. Great question. Thank you. All right, let's take another question from our audience. Good afternoon, sir. This is MC1 Gamble from here at Defense Media Activity. <laughs> uh, my question for you is, uh, the Navy has been 100% uh, on TA for the longest time, and even when the other branches of services dropped TA, the Navy kept it at 100%, but I've heard talk of them possibly going down to maybe 75%. Do you have any word on that, sir? A question I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> talking about some skin in the game. Heard that comment before? Skin in the game. What we're talking about, now first of all, just for everybody's information, for the rest of the fiscal year, we're at 100%. We're not changing anything for the rest of the year. So you'll see a lot of um, 
uh, advertisement and a lot of information out there about if you want to go to school, here's the time. And we don't want anybody to get nervous that we're not going to have TA anymore. We just want to make sure that we're giving every sale the opportunity that qualifies to um, utilize TA is taking advantage of that. But what you might see is exactly what you talked about, a 75 cent government Navy pays, 25 percent sailor pay. Because we believe that if there's some investment in there from um, the sailor, they get, become a little bit more committed. This is not just something I can do because it's free. And, and not that we've had a lot of sailors taking advantage of TA, but again, as we talk about um, the budget and, and ways that we can be good stewards of the budget, budget, here's an opportunity for us to be mindful of 75 military, 25 for the sailor. And I think when I went back, I'm not gonna tell how long ago that was, but when I first came in, that's what I did. I was on the 75, 25% program and, and I did not not want to go because I had to pay that 25%. So I think it would still be a good deal for sailors. What do you think? I think it would be a good deal, Master Chief. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Master Chief. You're Thank welcome. you, sir. In regards to TA, now that can still be used to pay for certifications through Navy Cool as well, correct? TA? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of opportunities yeah. to go out there and get some education, so take advantage of them. And by the way, um, to Fleet's point about we're at 100% this year, we got cash, folks. I got cash to loan you for tuition assistance, and we're not eating into the cash at the rate we expected. So if you're thinking, even thinking about uh, signing up for courses, doing certifications, do it now. Get it signed up for while we still have that cash available. Because once we cross over to the next fiscal year, we start over again. So there's opportunity for you right now. We have a question that was pre-recorded from USS Truman. So we're going to go to that. Hi, sir. I'm Ellis One Tompkins aboard USS Harris Truman. And my question for you is, is the Navy generating a more effective sexual assault prevention program? And if so, when can we expect to hear about that? Ellis One asks a great question as well. Um, so I think we've done, as a Navy, done a very nice job uh, of, of giving baseline training to educate people on what sexual assault is, how to recognize early behaviors that may lead to sexual assault, and, and giving people some tools about not only how to recognize, but maybe how to deal with people that may be going down a destructive path. Uh, what we haven't done in the fleet, but have done at Great Lakes, is had a lot of peer-on-peer -peer interaction, small group settings, very personal, uh, where you can have frank, honest discussions about this topic. Uh, we tend to do it the old Navy way. We build PowerPoint slides. We stand up in a theater with 100, 200, 300, 400 people in it, and, and people start nodding off in the back and uh, not paying attention. But we, you know, we, call, it, we call it training, and, and off we go. We cannot do that with sexual assault training. Uh, so we're taking the training that we think is pretty darn effective at Great Lakes, which is that small peer-to-peer um, intervention kind of training, and we're moving that to the waterfront as well. So we're going to bring those smaller opportunities where you all get to sit down with peers and have a conversation. Learn from each other and, and, and try to start attacking it, because if you don't own this problem, if you don't take ownership of it, it we're, never going to, we're never truly going to affect change in the Navy. It can't be left up to guys like me and Fleet Master Chief. Okay, it's got, it's got to come from you, and we need to give you the tools, and then we, we frankly have to talk about it at that level. And so that's our plan this year is to start bringing that training to the, to the waterfront uh, and to small in every unit around the Navy so that, that you have the benefit of that kind of training. So, you know, often talks about creating a culture where sexual assault is not tolerated. So what can sailors do? to help create that culture, to be a part of it. What, what is our part of this? Thanks a lot, um, Admiral. I think um, one of our responsibilities, every sailor, and I know we talked about this too, is when we see something um, going on in our spaces around us, we need to talk about it. We need to hold each other accountable. We need to look each other in the eye and say, shipmate, not in my Navy. That's what we need to do. But sometimes that's hard, and we talk about the peer pressure of it, and that's what they talk about in these large, um, excuse me, small groups, is that's hard. This is, this is my shipmate. I've gone through boot camp. We went through A school together. Now we're sailing the ship together, and I see him walking down a path of destruction. Sometimes that's hard for me to say, come on, Petty Officer Beldo, you know, you, I, I know you want this job. You don't want to put yourself in that situation. 
you know, because then he might look, turn around and look at me and I'm no longer his friend now. Oh, oh, you're one of them. You're like that now. And that's hard. So that's what I think we need to do, though, is be able to, to remind them that we are just having this conversation with them because we want them to be successful. We want them to be in control of their um, career, however long that may be, and not anybody else. So it's standing up for each other and just looking each other in the eye and being honest with each other. You know, it's several years ago when we, we first started to attack this, um, sailors of, of this uh, cohort group, younger sailors, said they started self-organizing. And we eventually we formalized it a little bit and called it CSAD. And, and that coalition of young sailors trying to provide opportunities for other young sailors to do something non-destructive and very uh, beneficial to themselves, to their shipmates, to this, the local community in many cases has really kind of taken off around the fleet in, 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 in different areas. So we're, we continue to encourage the CSAD organizations to get out there. What I worry about is that we make it a precursor to uh, whether we select that person for sale of the year. We've got, to, we've got to allow CSAD to be what it was envisioned to be, which is a self-organizing group of sailors that are trying to find opportunity to do something else. Now, what we've got to do, what we owe that organization around the fleet is some money to be able to go do the things they need to do, whether it's just basic transportation to go out to Habitat for Humanity, to go work a farm with a some, uh, uh, some veterans, or, or you go to a local hospital or an elderly care. Those are the kinds of things that sailors get to do, but, but they're, they're often restricted or limited by their ability to get there. So we're looking at how we can provide some funding for that. But I don't want the fleet to start taking this on as, uh, as another association that it becomes um, you know, competition for how you're gonna advance. That, then it's counterproductive in my view. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next question, we're gonna go back to San Diego. So San Diego, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hello, good, good morning, sir. How are you doing? This is Adi Wimpestillian from uh, PC2 America here in San Diego. And uh, I had a question regarding to uh, the advancement program there as far as possibly be changing in the future. Uh, has there been any guidelines regarding uh, what it take effect as far as for the CAP program uh, for these sailors out here in the CDW? All right, I heard you talk about two different programs. You talked about the advancement exam, and then I heard you talk about CAP program. I think I heard you say that. So as far as the advancement exam, let's talk about that first with regards to our initiative to um, change the weighting that we put on whether it's your performance evaluation or whether it's the test score. Um, probably not giving so many points for PNA because you stuck around long enough and you've maxed out on your PNA points and that's what gets you um, over the standard score that you need to advance. So we are looking at that and um, we see that probably coming in effect not until next um, year about the same time. What about the cap did you ask? Okay, uh, an, I know majority of these sellers out here, uh, me as, a, as far as a senior leader, uh, they, they read it through Navy Times and they kind of hear it through um, as far as other sailors that they may, they may go away downsizing or taking a program away so it kind of takes that uh, initiative for other sailors kind of work harder towards maybe receiving, maybe being that one selectee from that program so uh, that's kind of my concern that you know I, I kind of wanted to know if there's any been guidelines as far as they are they going to be taking away the program or are they actually downsizing it because of the advancement. All right. As far as the CAP program, there's another myth buster we get to um, Go ahead and bust stomp it. out. We are not doing away with the CAP program. As of now, CAP is um, in place as, as it's always been. We are looking at, again, just making sure that we are providing every sailor the opportunity that they have uh, and every command the opportunity that they have to cap that number one um, performer um, that they have within their command. Um, there's no taking away, there's no reducing the numbers, um, there's always been a percentage, there's always been a percentage um, related to how many um, um, caps a command gets based on the size, and that's still going to be in place, shipmate. So, nope, that's another um, myth that we're going to stomp out right here. Cap is not going away, it's in place, we're just going to make sure we're tightening it up. Now, I will share with you, we do have some concerns as we continue manning the force properly and making sure that we have the right skills. Um, we're concerned about competitive rates. And what I mean when I talk about competitive rates are those rates that are overmanned. 
So you might see something come out with regards to making sure that we do not put a, any rate out there um, in a position where they're overmanned. So now your shipmate can advance on the Navy advancement of them because we've capped them. So you have sailors that are getting capped, which we want them to be capped, but then you have sailors that are taking a Navy advancement exam that can't get advanced because there's no more quotas because we've used them all in cap. So that's just one thing that we, um, as we go through the program, are gonna make sure that we keep a close eye on so we don't put any of our rates in a situation where they become overmanned. Hope that answers your question, shipmate. Okay, next we have a question that came in via social media. A sailor wrote and asks, I've been hearing that boot camp will be three months long by implementing combat training. How would fleet sailors go about getting that training? What have you heard about it, sir? Okay, another myth. Um, I hadn't even heard this. So boot, boot camp is eight weeks? Eight and a half weeks. Sorry. Eight yes, and a half weeks. Uh, we're not yes, going to change that. Um, if we did change it, I'd ask everybody who didn't do the full three months to go back through. Is that okay? <laughs> No? Okay. Um, now, I think what, what he's asking, though, is uh, he's heard of some, some other types of combat training. Uh, I'm not aware of that. We're certainly not going to add to boot camp to, uh, to, to, to provide that. So I'd have, to, I'd have to learn a little bit more about what specifically the sailor's referring to. But boot camp's eight weeks, eight and a half weeks. No plans to change it. Under that. We are going to take a brief studio question. Sir, Petty Officer Bauer from Fleet Cyber. I've got a quick question. Uh, I know you're getting a lot of questions about the budget talks uh, with regards to personnel, but if with the budget talks, uh, are there any plans to close bases or ports? Uh, if there are, do you know of any? So he asked a brief question. I can give a briefer answer. No. <laughs> No, no plans. Okay. Now you're going to read about uh, you know, members in Congress debating whether we need to do another BRAC in the future. Mm -hmm. um, you may hear uh, folks in OSD talk about it, uh, but we have no plans to, to close bases or units at this, at this time, none. All right. Thanks for the question. Thank you very much, sir. And we're going to take a real quick question from San Diego. San Diego, go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Um, one of my questions is with the change on the advancement system. Are they going to planning on adding points for people that have dual warfare designations and maybe for a fitness, physical fitness assessment of scores? Quick answer. Quick answer. Um, Shipmate, right now we are not looking to make any changes in those particular areas. I heard you say fitness um, scores and whether you have dual warfare qualifications. Those were not two of the things that went into the change that's going to come up for the advancement exam. Thank you for the question. Okay. That is all we have time for. I want to thank you so much, Admiral Fleet Beldo, for joining us. And uh, we have a few moments for some closing remarks, if you would like to give some. Well, first of all, thanks for allowing us to come out here. And I uh, appreciate everybody coming to listen and ask great questions. Um, I, I guess I'm most impressed by the, the level uh, of the questions. Great questions. They allowed us to talk about things that we're working on back in, uh, in the Bureau uh, that are designed to, to support sailors and families uh, throughout the fleet. And, and I can tell you, as hard as these, these days are in terms of understanding where we are with the budget and what's happening with force structure, we're in a really good place in the Navy because of decisions that have been made over the last couple of years to stabilize the force. And I think if there's a message that I'd like you to take back uh, to your units and to your shipmates is that the Navy's in a relatively stable position and it looks like we're gonna stay that way for as far as we can see. Uh, right. But that also and means well. we're gonna be out there operating um, a little bit you know, more than, uh, Admiral, more than we have. Thank you. I really apologize for, cut off. <laughs> for cutting you off. But uh, thank you once again for joining us and uh, taking part in today's All Hands Call. If you want, or if your submitted questions were not answered on the air, they will be answered on ah.mil, so check them out there. Uh, on behalf of Defense Media Activity, I'm Petty Officer Brandi Wills. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me.